I mean, really all told, it is grotty down here and it's full of spiders and it is where that boy died. But the acoustics in here are better than the ones upstairs. <laughs> It's James Stephanie Sterling here to talk about my favourite subject and yours, Nintendo. Now, in today's video, I'm not calling Nintendo a terrorist. A Nintendo wrist. That doesn't work. Nintendo tactics. There we go. Nintendo, as we're about to discuss, is on a bit of a warpath, and of course we have got to talk about the man who done a bit of a piracy and ended up in jail, in prison, with a life-wrecking debt. Uh, there is a tweet going around um, daring video game reviewers to mention in their Tears of the Kingdom review, which at one point in this video I'm pretty sure are called Tears of the Kingdom, um, just daring reviewers to actually mention uh, what they did to that man. And I don't know, seems fair. Uh, when I reviewed Breath of the Wild, there were a lot of Zelda fans telling me they only wanted objective facts in their reviews, and that is a pretty objective fact. Uh, anyway, I don't really much care about Tears of the Kingdom. I'm more interested in Key to the Kingdom. The hot new game from Waddington's from the 90s. Fan gave this to me years ago, and I've had no excuse to use it on camera, but it sounds a bit like Tears of the Kingdom, so, so there we go. There's a brand new game with a brand new board and many sides where perils are stored. Tears of the Kingdom. It's a magic world of whirling pools, temples and treasures and glistening jewels. Tears of the Kingdom. If you haven't got the weapons and tools, how are you going to fight those grisly ghouls? Find the key, you're on your way home, but don't forget the cantankerous gnome. How could I forget the cantankerous gnome? He's cantankerous! It is morally okay to pirate Nintendo's games. It's a mantra I've shared for many years now. A statement largely only controversial among Nintendo fans themselves, and fuck em. The statement was originally a flippant response to the company's seizure of ad revenue from YouTubers, who dared to show even the briefest snippet of footage from one of its games. But many legit reasons have been argued too. Pirating content from any multi-billion dollar corporation is okay because their profits are outright theft. Stealing from a corporation is really reclamation. Nintendo received money from questionable sources, and I think it's acceptable if anyone would like to undermine that. Then there's the fact that Nintendo does stupid shit to actively thwart customers' attempts to make legal purchases. From arbitrary release restrictions in different territories to the outright closure of storefronts like the recently shuttered eShop, Nintendo has on more than one occasion sent the clear message that it often doesn't want your money. Sometimes it leaves would-be customers no other choice but piracy. Then there's the fact it's bringing weapon durability back for the new Zelda. Proof positive that it's always morally okay to pirate Nintendo's games. Oh! Recently, however, Nintendo has countered that philosophy not by fixing its shit, but by completely crushing opponents with ruthless aggression. It's not just about piracy, or emulation, either. Like a cigar-chomping gangster in a classic pinstripe suit, the platform holders looking to make an example of anyone who crosses it. Yes! Some of you may think Nintendo's actions of late are in the right. Some may think otherwise. Exactly what is a reasonable protection of one's business and what is a grossly unfair overstep can be debated all day, but one thing must be made clear. Nintendo is going further with these attack-based protections than the average game publisher, and it's reasonable to assume the consistent raising of the stakes is purposeful. If Nintendo normalizes extreme life-wrecking methods of punishing transgressions or perceived transgressions, the fear of retribution could have a chilling effect. Make no mistake, Nintendo's employing terror tactics, in my opinion, it's using disproportionate retribution as an open threat to anybody who'd follow in the footsteps of those said retribution was enacted upon. In fact, it's a little more than just my opinion, as we'll argue later, it's the explicitly stated 
point. We will of course be talking about the whole Gary Bowser thing, but there's also Nintendo's alleged exertion of pressure on retail chain GameStop to fire an employee who posted a screenshot on Reddit. This rather dull image of the store's inventory was, in all fairness, a leak, confirming the imminent arrival of a special edition Zelda-themed Switch, you know the Switch that had already been leaked multiple times since last Christmas, to the point where calling it an open secret would undersell the complete dearth of secrecy on offer. Leaks happen. They're common, and the pantomime performed by game companies as they pretend such leaks haven't happened to maintain a sense of control over their big announcements is a performance older than... something. Ran out of metaphors. Usually, leaks come out, they do the rounds, the leak thing is announced, and we all go on with our lives. Nintendo, however, as part of its overall campaign of vengeance, is said by this particular leaker to have reached out to the Massachusetts GameStop where he worked to get him fired. Mark insists that while he did post the image, he didn't take the picture himself and used it for a mostly speculative post in which he hoped to get fellow Zelda fans prepared for a potential pre-order announcement. The post itself didn't gain much tra- Fuck. The post itself didn't gain much traction and Mark didn't think it was altogether a big deal. Nintendo did, and tracked him down, with Mark getting a talking to and being placed on suspension before his eventual termination. A district manager allegedly told him off the record that Nintendo was pushing them for the highest possible punishment instead of suspensions or warnings, a claim backed up by one of Mark's former co-workers. Now look, it's not exactly unfair that if you violate company policy, you risk your job. But while GameStop springs leaks all the time and publishers just roll with it, Nintendo going this far is a level of harsh we just don't see very often in the industry. And it's part of a years-long commitment to pursuing any and all leakage with utmost severity. The company is currently trying to subpoena Discord, legally pressuring the messaging platform to hand over personal details of one of its users over some leaked images from the Zelda Tears of a Kingdom art book. The image is circulated via the unofficial server known as the Tears of the Kingdom official Discord server. Nintendo wants all the deets of the user, as revealed in a filing with the Northern District Court of California, pushing for the real name, address, email and phone number. As well as this one user, Nintendo's legal team compiled a list of users with PDF in their usernames and tried to get the entire Discord server shut down. In some ways I can hardly blame Nintendo, I heard there's a lot of PDF files on Discord. Hi, Rick Mail here. I don't know if you're like me, immensely rich, talented, handsome. Isn't it a bore? Well, I found the answer. Zelda Link's Awakening from Nintendo. You play a medieval elf named Link. You travel through many worlds, meeting endless characters on your eternal adventures. So hey, next time you're Rick Mail, why not try? Zelda Link's Awakening. I think you'll like it. Ciao. Zelda, an evolving and inexhaustible Nintendo. Nintendo hates leaks, if you couldn't guess. It's paranoid about them. It keeps strategy guides under tarps in secured areas where recording devices are banned, it's so paranoid. They probably keep games in that big plastic box that Magneto lives in. And maybe you think that's fine. A little less fine, however, is Nintendo electing to be a prize-winning cunt to a seemingly harmless game modder. Nintendo is currently attempting to annihilate the YouTube channel of modder and streamer Point Crow for the crime of creating a multiplayer mod for Breath of the Wild. Nintendo's methods in this case are ones I'm incredibly familiar with, having been subjected to them by a number of oversensitive game developers in the past, and they involve abusing YouTube's copyright system to manipulate its three-strike policy. It started with Nintendo blocking Point Crow's videos about his Breath of the Wild multiplayer mods on copyright grounds, an action he appealed against. Following Point Crow's dispute, Nintendo upped the ante, issuing a string of calculated copyright strikes in multiple batches, seemingly in a bid to get those three strikes a channel needs to qualify for a complete removal from YouTube. Crow Point attempted to be reasonable and contacted Nintendo, hoping for an amicable solution. Rather than dignify the modder with a response, Nintendo went ahead and claimed 20 fucking four more videos. The copyright claims went beyond footage of mods to become ever more spurious, issuing strikes on videos showing completely unmodified regular old gameplay. In my experienced opinion, 
These methods are fraudulent and constitute harassment. It's what Gilson B. Pontus notoriously attempted to hurt me with a few years ago and continues to attempt every year. It's a knowing misuse of the copyright system to attempt to bully, distress and cause financial harm to a content creator the aggressor doesn't like. And it's... It's like really fucking shitty. In the wake of Nintendo's bully boy bollock bashing, other creators have been able to publicise their own experiences, with one streamer revealing 10 of his videos were wiped out. Now, this is a little scary, because the precedent that they set uh, with this case may apply heavily for their upcoming release of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. As per their decisions to take down gameplay and challenge videos alongside the modified content, it'll be difficult for any content creator to post creative concepts without having the fear of Nintendo exercising their copyright over a video that is in line with their own policies. Given these decisions, I'm hesitant to post videos of myself playing Tears of the Kingdom, even with my creative input and commentary, for fear that they will also be taken down. I hope that is not the case. This reaction from Point Crow is exactly the point I was crowing about earlier. There's that fear I mentioned. There's the result of Ninterra tactics. They're setting a precedent, making examples of people, and causing the kind of fear that invokes a chilling effect among communities potentially affected. Which brings us to Gary Bowser, and back to the subject of piracy. Gary Bowser is a hacker. Gary Bowser sold devices that enabled piracy. Gary Bowser was sentenced to 40 months, over two years of prison for this. Gary Bowser has to pay a $4.5 million fine for this. Gary Bowser has to pay a $10 million civil suit settlement for this. In his salesman job as part of the hacking team executor, Bowser made $320,000 over seven years, which might just be a teeny tiny bit less than the $14.5 million Nintendo wants out of him. Now look, we all know he's never going to be able to give them that much. Nintendo knows he's never going to be able to give them that much. But it's not about that, is it? It's about disproportionately wrecking someone's life so completely and permanently as to ensure nobody else wants to ever conceive of chancing it themselves. Nintendo has fixed it so that it's entitled, for a strictly legal definition of the word entitled, to take a staggering 25-30% to 30 out of Bowser's personal income for essentially the rest of his life. And they started this by nabbing $175 of the pittance he got working his prison job. Fucking harsh! Of course, when I say Nintendo gets a cut for the rest of his life, that's not the official ruling, it's simply the practical effect. There's so little chance of Bowser paying off the debt while he lives that it might as well constitute perpetuity. Even if you don't think it's morally okay to pirate all of Nintendo's games, and it is, there is no way in rational reality that Nintendo is even the slightest bit sympathetic in this situation. Gary Bowser's physical health is such that prison time presented a very genuine risk. Think about that for a moment. Bowser was at risk of physical harm, and that risk was considered negligible compared to Nintendo's desire to prove a point. That's not recompense. It's a punishment far too big to fit the crime. Corporations who commit far worse crimes pay about the same as Gary did without the prison time and make so much cash that for them it's a comparative slap on the wrist. You know what they say about speeding tickets, right? If some people can afford the fine and some people can't, then speeding isn't the crime. The crime is being poor. It's not a fair system. It's not a justice system. It's spite, is what it is. The very fact Bowser spent any time in prison for this is fucking offensive. Because even if you believe the lie that prison is a place of correction and not revenge, this particular example was quite specifically vengeance. The explicit aim being to destroy a man so completely it scares the fucking shit out of everyone. The judge admitted it too. 
Gavel, gavel, bang, bang. I always tell the jurors, your role is not to send a message. Your role is to decide guilt or innocence on these facts. He said, I don't know if he sounds like that. That's just my judge voice. But my role sometimes does entail sending a message. <laughs> oh, I've myself dizzy. And there you go. Gary didn't go to prison because he deserved it. By the judge's own apologia, it wasn't a case of deserve. It was a case of satisfying corporate interests, doing Nintendo's dirty work, and performing the legislative equivalent of mounting someone's head on a spike. As far as this bountifully breasted bint is concerned, Nintendo may have made it scarier to leak its info, mod its content, and pirate its games, but the Nintendo tactics it's employing to do so only make it more morally okay to do so. So I just pull the string and it'll... Yeah? Okay. Rejoice! Did that work? Good enough. Blah! <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Hello there. Commander Stephanie Starling here to tell you about what's gonna happen on May 12th when Effie's big Gay brunch comes to Liverpool. <laughs> I'm very excited about this and I'll tell you why because three years ago Effie himself stood not two feet before me and he said we simply have to get you on a big gay brunch. Well, I was very excited about that and I waited for my call and I waited for my call and I waited for my call and then I stopped living in the United States so I stopped waiting for my call. But they're bringing the brunch to Britain and the commander can no longer be denied. I am going to finally make it to the brunch and I am going to do what I do best. Command and conquer. The rainbow rumple is mine to win. I have to win, because, you see, Effie knew a very different Stephanie Sterling. Effie knew a Stephanie Sterling who wasn't sure of themselves, who couldn't find a trainer to take them seriously, who couldn't find enough promotions, who understood what they were. Well, the people bringing the gay brunch to Britain, they come from a world I used to run in. A world I desperately tried to fit into, but never quite could. And now, now it's in my world, where a fully trained, fully deadly, and fully delicious Commander Sterling reigns supreme. The Rainbow Rumble is where I prove what I've been longing to prove for a very long time, and that is that the world I could never fit into had something special on its hands when it had past tense Commander Sterling. Yes, Commander. All told, this is a uh, shorter episode than I have been liking lately. Um, I, I like to get until around that sort of 20 minutes level, that sort of American TV show time without the ads. Um, but the Gary Bowser thing, in my opinion, was a lot more cut and dry than I thought it was going to be. Um, I thought there was going to be a lot more uh, to it, a lot more um, nuance, but I don't think there is. I think Nintendo's been a shit and is being shit. Uh, the examples I talked about are only real recent ones, like super recent ones, uh, that have been in the headlines, but they've been doing this for a while now, tracking down uh, anyone who transgresses, uh, trying to find their, their personal info, trying to press for the highest punishments possible when they're not that harmed by it. Even if you ignore the anti-corporate thing, they are a multi-billion dollar corporation. The quote unquote harm being done to them is a drop in the bucket. And when they're demanding billions from someone who literally doesn't have it, when they're sending someone to prison, when it's a physical health risk to them, I don't know 
how Nintendo is sympathetic in that. Well, well, there's a really cool, cute Mario movie coming out and the kids are so happy. And oh, Tears of the Kingdom is coming out and, and Zelda fans are so happy. Fuck off. At the very least, it deserves calling out. It's, there's nothing to protect. There's nothing to be sympathetic about. Um, the only other thing that remains to be said is thank God for me.